I, I guess it probably would be good to like look into like what happened like in the history. So and um, one thing we could start is this uh, this uh, Colossus. This is actually one of the first programmable computer. And you'll see a lot of knobs here. And it's actually a classical computer based on the mechanical mechanical devices. Okay, so you can pro you can switch you can make the change those switches so that you can make you can program for the computer. And you may notice that the size of the computer is huge, while the computational power is actually still quite limited. Okay, so historically, such a device was designed developed by kind of the British code breakers during around like the, during the Second World War to decipher some of this, uh, this device particular decipher this uh, Lorentz cycle. So it's actually it does play an important role in history. Okay, but nowadays actually weighs the significant advance in these uh, like a, uh, uh, in this like a transistor technology. Now we can actually like shrink all these devices to something that we can hold in our hand. Okay, so for example, our iPhone is definitely more powerful than the device that I showed earlier on. And we can build even like a clusters with like the fastest like a supercomputer, which can even outperform like anything that we can do like earlier on. Despite these advances, that uh, okay, so somehow like there are still lots of problems that we cannot solve with these supercomputers. And just to name two, for example, one is this high temperature superconductivity. Okay, so for high TC, it is still controversial. What is the underlying mechanism that enable this device to be like really like a starting superconducting at a much higher temperature? And it's also more intriguing for us to, if we could understand such a mechanism, can we develop new material that will be uh, superconducting even at a room temperature? Which actually recently there's some advanced that people say put a huge amount of pressure, then you can make device superconducting at the room temperature, but that's probably still a little bit like uh, too far from real applications because the amount of pressure applied is kind of like a ridiculously high. So it's still like a wide open field to look for like a high TC, maybe room temperature, like a, or even reasonable pressure device that uh, can exist. So it's still important. And we, our ability to understand such things is limited because actually the whole system is quantum. Okay, if we use uh, like a classical device to describe a quantum system, you will find that once you go to like a larger quantum size here, if you count the number of atoms, if you want to characterize these orbitals, it will be a huge dimension or you need a huge amount of storage to store and track the evolution of such a quantum system. And the other case is related to this uh, nitrogen fixation. So here is actually like a, a particular protein and inside the protein, there is a particular structure. If you look at it, it's not that big. Okay, just have a few dozen of that. And uh, however, we still don't know like how this thing worked to, uh, to play the role of uh, nitrogen fixation, which is actually a very important like process that for the plants to actually to convert those nitrogen molecules into something which that biologically that you can use be useful. So this is something which also we don't know what's going on. And uh, even though it works at the room temperature, this process itself, people suspect that it will evolve in the quantum processes going on. So that's why it's also hard to really fully understand such a device with our classical supercomputers because it's still too complicated for a classical device to do. Okay, so the underlying reason it's challenging is because it's a quantum mechanics that determines the underlying evolution. It's not our classical mechanics. So therefore, it's too complicated for our classical device to do. So that's the reason we are kind of limited in trying to further simulate or understand these processes. So this actually leads to the point which uh, like Richard Feynman pointed out that, okay, we should take a different perspective. Okay, instead of saying, okay, we work really hard to build a more classical computer to understand the quantum system, it's probably better to actually build a quantum machine study the laws of quantum mechanics, okay? So therefore we can probably build it more efficiently so that uh, a quantum device will be able to uh, give you a better performance than any of the classical device that may be possible. All right, so now I, I guess that probably people have a probably different uh, level of understanding of quantum mechanics. So probably I just like to point out the two 
ingredients, which is unique in quantum. Okay, so first ingredient, which is superposition. So we know that in classical bits, we can have uh, either zero or one, but only one of these two possible values for a classical bit. But for a quantum bits, you can actually have a continuous choice from zero and one. Okay, you can be in a superposition. And actually this superposition, you can even have some complex coefficients to form these superpositions. And one way to think of it is that uh, kind of in the optical field, you can have different polarizations. And when you superpose different polarizations, you can actually get a circular or elliptical polarization. Okay, so that actually gives you a lot of additional degree of freedom that you can continuously change from zero to one. Okay, so this superposition is important in many aspects. So first, if you think that you have um, just like a, a hundred bits, then you only store a hundred bits of information. But if you could have a hundred qubits, then you can sort of simultaneously track the superposition of evolutions of two to the hundred possible states. Okay, I'm just saying simultaneously track, but uh, of course it's a non-trivial task to read out that information, which is actually the part that is non-trivial to develop efficient quantum algorithms. But at least it kind of mimics the quantum nature that you can consider simultaneous evolution of different superpositions. So that's why there is a potential possibility of speed up in quantum computing, because you have this capability of doing superposition as well as simulation. And for sensing, the story is more like, okay, if you have a signal which is very weak, then for the classical bits, it probably will be less likely you actually will flip zero to one. While in the quantum case, you can sort of continuously change from zero to one. And that actually gives you the possibility of improve the sensitivity of your sensor. So that's actually important that you continuously changing and which is actually the key underlying reason why actually some of the quantum sensors that people are thinking about like uh, uh, entangled quantum clocks that will give you a better sensitivity. Okay, so these are actually the superposition is the first ingredient which enables speed up in computation and the quantum simulation and also gives the potential improvement in sensing. And the other ingredient is entanglement. And one way to think of entanglement is that it is like a, a classical correlation, but it is ultra strong in its correlation. So in a sense that there is no correspondence that can the entanglement that exists in the classical world. So simple example is that, for example, if you generate like entangled photons, then if you measure one photon in horizontal polarization, then you can immediately know that the other photon must be in vertical polarization, in the opposite polarization, okay? So if you measure in circular, left circular, then the other one will be in right circular. So you can, if you measure one, you sort of immediately know what the other one needs to be. So therefore such an ultra strong correlation uh, can, and also doesn't matter which basis you measure. If you measure one photon in certain states, then you know immediately the other states the other photon must be in orthogonal state in the other, in, on the other side. Okay, so this is actually something called quantum entanglement, which is an ultra strong correlation, which don't have a classical correspondence. And another unique property of entanglement is that it's actually something called a monogamy. Okay, if I have two quantum bits, which is maximum entangled, then there is a guarantee that there should be zero correlation with the rest of the world. Okay, because of this monogamy property, it sort of ensures that the, the correlation shared between the two parties which share entanglement, it's guaranteed only shared between those two parties. And then nobody else will have any correlation with these two parties. So therefore that's important to generate a secret key, then that will ensure secure communication. Okay, so then kind of like the two key ingredients, again, is superposition and the entanglement. And then once you have these two, basically you can have some intuitive understanding of why we may have some quantum advantage using quantum algorithm for computing, simulation, sensing, or communication. Okay, so yeah, uh, I guess yeah. that's probably it's more like at a higher level. Yeah, please. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, ben, you can ask your question now. Oh yes, thank uh, you. I just wanted to. Okay, uh, I don't see the chat window, so yeah, please just read out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry. I, uh, I raised my hand on the thing. Um, I, I yeah. wanted to ask you if you could explain a little bit more what it means to be maximally entangled. Ah, okay, good. So 
uh, yes, indeed, it is uh, uh, a bit vague when I say maximally entangled. And one way to think of it is that, uh, suppose I have two quantum bits, okay? And uh, one way to say maximally entangled um, is that the state should have no correlation with the rest of the universe. And if the two states are in a pure state, okay, then the maximum entangled means that if I take away one system, a half of uh, one qubit, then the remaining qubit will be in something called a maximally mixed state. Okay, so it's a kind of like a, there is no way to predict what the state is. Okay, and so that's in the context when the, they're initially in the pure state and that it's going to take away one half, then the remaining party will be in a maximum mixed state. So that's kind of one way to understand it's maximum entangled because all the correlation, uh, all the information sort of like carrying this one is really dependent on what the other system is. Okay, yeah. And another way to think of maximum entangled is that uh, sort of like a, uh, that enables you, there's some other thing called a teleportation. You can teleport the maximum amount of information possible with such an entanglement. Okay, which is, uh, um, which is, you can think that you maximize the possible uh, resource, which is the entanglement based on this physical system. Okay, yeah. And the, the reason I mentioned maximum entangle because there could be partial entangle. And partial entangle, then the system may have some kind of possibility of correlating with the rest of the universe. So that's why, like, at least conceptually, it's easy to think if it's maximum entangle, then there should be no correlation with the rest of the universe. Uh -huh. Thanks so, so, so well, if it were in a lecture, I'll probably write down a maximum entangled state, but I guess that maybe for here, I guess maybe just give you some intuition and you can probably look it up, like what's the maximum entangled state. It probably will give you a more concrete uh, explanation. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, are there other questions? Yeah. Okay, yeah, feel free to stop me since uh, I think uh, this is, Okay, we can have an informal chat in here. So I guess that maybe it probably would be good to get some intuition about what the qubit is. Okay, sometimes people will say spin, and sometimes people will say super igniting qubits, and so on. And I guess that's probably, I guess if people have learned something about the opt, probably one easy way to understand the qubit is to think it as a single photon. Okay, we know that a single photon may have different polarization. It can be horizontal or vertical or could be like a left circular or right circular, right? So I think, and also could be like a, a off diagonal or diagonal polarization. So there are like all these possible different like uh, polarizations the photon may have. And if you think that, okay, the possible ways of writing these different polarizations, then you actually just need uh, two real numbers to characterize the polarization that you may have. Okay, so for example, it's one number tells you, okay, what's the fraction that it will be in horizontal? What's the fraction it will be in vertical? And once you fix the fraction, you sort of like a, will be in one of these circles. And then you may want to know, okay, what's the relative phase between these two superpositions? Okay, so and this is actually a Poincare sphere, which characterizes the polarization of the photon. And similarly in qubit, it's called a block sphere, which characterizes the state of the qubit. Okay, so now let's, start with this single photon as a qubit. And the one can, first thing is, okay, how do we initialize a single photon? Yes, you can do it. If you have a, a single photon emitter, then you can control the emitted photon with a fixed polarization, then you can initialize such a single photon. Okay, and some good emitters could be like some defects in diamond called the nitrogen vacancy center in diamond. And uh, some story about the diamond defect is that sometimes that's okay, if you look at the diamond, they could look like a yellowish, it's because there are nitrogen in there. And some of them could also like, uh, if you look more carefully, some of the reddish, it's bec some, sometimes because there's some like this nitrogen vacancy center in there, okay? And uh, then these defect centers, the individual emitters, they emit one photon at a time, okay? So now in terms of optics, you can also think that, okay, how do we control different polarizations? There's something called the bifringe fringe effect. Okay, if you get a, a kind of crystal, a single crystal in here, then you'll find that actually when you pu put it over a single line, you see actually two lines. It's because actually the scattered photon from this um, paper down there will have 
two different polarizations. One is horizontal polarization, the other is vertical polarization. And those polarizations, when they go across this crystal, they will have a different uh, uh, kind of propagation speed. Okay. And then in, if you look at from an angle, which is offset a little bit, not directly from the top, then you will have a different diffraction and they see effectively two lines, two imaging lines. Okay. And this indicates that you can have a different control over different phase and different type polarization. And that you can think of it as a, doing a quantum qubit, doing a qubit rotation over the information encoded with the polarization of a photon. Okay. So now if you want to measure the polarization of a photon, one way to do it is you can use a polarizer to filter out one polarization and only let the other polarization pass through. And when we see it is that if, if you like taking a photograph, you will see like oh, if you can put a filter when you look at the reflected photon, when you look at the pond, and that will filter out the reflected photon, which has a well-defined polarization, then you will be able to see what's underneath it. Okay. So that is something which kind of like you can get it from your everyday life that actually can allows you to sort of measure the qubit state so encoded in a single photon. Okay. And another thing which could be fun is actually our eyes are very sensitive to photons. And sometimes that before we have a single photon detectors, there are like experiments which people carried out in Russia that just to have a trained experimental assistant just sitting there and watching single photons. Okay, it's probably approximately a single photon detector which kind of our eyes are evolving so well that they can already be sensitive to all these signals. So. Uh, just maybe the, the reason for showing this slide is just to, to tell you that sometimes the qubit is not that complicated. You could encode the information with a single photon in its polarization, and you can control the polarization with a fringe effect, and you can even measure it with a polarizer. Okay, and then then actually one immediate application is the photon with different polarization can immediately be useful for quantum random number generators. Okay, we know that random number generation is actually an important thing in computer science and also security. And we can actually generate random numbers with just a, a single photon. Okay, because if you prepare a photon in 45 degree polarization, which here we call like superposition of horizontal and vertical, which can be prepared with uh, some single photon emitters, then you can let it go through a beam splitter, polarizing beam splitter, so that horizontal photon goes through vertical photon being reflected. Then you can put your photon detector at the end and measure the photon counts. If the photon detector D1 gets a click, you say it's one. If photon detector D0 associated with vertical polarization gets a click, you get zero. When you have a 45 degree polarization photon coming in, actually nobody knows which detector will click until you detect the signal. So it is completely random and nobody can predict it. Okay, so this, and also if you choose a polarization properly, okay, and it will give you an unbiased random number generator, give you random sequences of zeros and ones when you have a stream of single photon coming in. So this is actually a very natural way of generating random numbers, which is actually completely random, and which is different from kind of our, if you use a computer to generate random numbers, sometimes there will be a seed to generate, which is a pseudo random number. But in this case, there's a physical way to generate random numbers, which is completely random. So this is actually a really cool aspect, like uh, that quantum mechanics can naturally give you this randomness. Okay, so now let's maybe getting a little bit into kind of an application for this quantum. And uh, as we look into further, quantum also have a very exotic property called the quantum known cloning property. So the statement of known cloning is saying that unknown quantum state cannot be perfectly cloned. So suppose I give you one copy of quantum state that you, I don't tell you what the state is, then there is no way that you can make a perfect copy of the same state, okay? So if you know what the state is, sure, you can make multiple copies of it. But if you don't know what the state is, there's no way to make a perfect copy. And uh, actually like uh, you can prove the no cloning in three lines, okay? I think it's probably up to kind of uh, to say, okay, yeah, probably like we know, I know how to prove no cloning. And uh, even uh, another thing, even though we know how to clone a sheep, but actually we can, cannot clone a single quantum state. Okay. Uh, the proof is the following that uh, um, so suppose we prove that contradiction. Suppose we have a cloning machine which can duplicate any single photon state that's prepared. 
Okay. And suppose that putting a, horizontal, a vertical polarization photon, it will give two vertical polarization photons as output. If I have horizontal polarization photon, it will give two horizontal polarization photons as output. Okay. Then, okay, according to quantum mechanics, which first we can have a superposition of input, which say superposition of horizontal vertical polarization photon coming in, say 45 degree polarization photon, then the output should have some correspondence, right? And on the other hand, we know that quantum mechanics is also a linear evolution involved under like Schrodinger equations. So the input is a superposition of uh, horizontal vertical. Then the output will also be a superposition of these two outputs that you can get from the cloning machine from step one and step two. So according to this linearity of quantum mechanics, the output will be a superposition of horizontal or vertical vertical photon plus horizontal horizontal photon. Okay, so here I'm being a little bit uh, like a, a non rigorous without writing the coefficient, but here it's really just demonstrating the superposition according to the linearity of quantum mechanics. However, this state is different from two copies of 45 degree polarization photon because one way to see it here, you have actually four different combinations while on the left, you only get two different combinations. So it's not the same. So basically with these three lines, you can show that this quantum mechanics, actually there is, you cannot perfectly clone unknown quantum states. For example, these three possible states, you cannot make simultaneously make all three happy, okay? So on one hand, this is a negative result, so you cannot perfectly clone. Uh, but if you take a different perspective, this is a really nice property because there are lots of things that you don't want people to clone or duplicate, such as secret messages or some application like quantum money. You don't want people to make fake money. So if they cannot duplicate, then it's good. So now maybe we can take a, like a, uh, a quick look at like, okay, the immediate implication from known cloning is we can do quantum cryptography. So because we know that quantum, uh, and so, so before we talk about the quantum cryptography, it might be good to talk about, okay, why and how we actually communicate secretly with uh, like a private key. Okay, so in the next slide here, tentatively, uh, let's forget about the quantum mechanics for the moment. Let's just think a scenario that you want to have a secret communication with another party. Okay, so one way to do it is that suppose the two parties initially share a secret key, which here is 10110101, which only shared between the two parties and nobody else knows what the secret key is. So in that case, it will be perfect for the purpose of secret communication. Because for example, Alice wants to send a message, which is 11001100. And she wants to send a message to Bob. The way that she can do is to perform an XOR between the message and the key. Okay. And that will give an encrypted message. And once you do the bitwise binary sum, it becomes 0111001. Okay. Because the secret key is completely random. So therefore, actually, the encrypted message is completely random. Okay. So basically there is no pattern in here and then nobody can figure out what it is unless you have the key. So what Alice can do is she can safely publicly announce what the encrypted message is. So Bob will get the knowledge of the encrypted message. And what Bob can do is Bob perform another XOR, a bitwise binary sum between her, uh, between his secret key and the encrypted message. And what you find is that once you perform the bitwise binary sum, actually the original message being restored. And that's a way to restore the message without uh, letting the environment to know what the true message is, okay? And it uses the property that if you binary, perform a binary sum over the secret message twice, it does nothing. It restores the original message, okay? So this is actually really helpful. And uh, however, there is a catch that the, actually the secret key, you better use it only once, okay? If you use it multiple times, you actually might potentially leak out the information to the environment. And here is a reason that suppose you use the key k, uh, k vector k twice. Suppose the first time you use message m1, use a key to encrypt it to message e1. 
Second time you message M2, use the same key to encrypt it as the encrypted message E2. So now this time the environment will have access to both E1 and E2. And what this eavesdropper can do is simply perform a bitwise binary sum of E1 and E2, like here. Okay, because the K, if you perform a binary sum twice, it goes to trivial operation. Then essentially this is the same as you perform a bitwise binary sum of M1 and M2. So by measuring this E1, E2 that the environment have access to, they will be able to infer what is some properties of a message you want to send. And that's not good because that actually essentially leak out the information and because you reuse your secret key. So now here comes the need that, okay, is there some way that we can generate more secret keys? Then we will be able to achieve more secure communication. So you can think that the quantum cryptography is a procedure that supposedly start from a short sequence of secret key that the two parties know each other. Then you can generate more and more secret keys so that you will be able to achieve like a secure communication and over uh, like a longer message. Okay, so and uh, this is the scenario. Now suppose Alice and Bob, they are two parties. Okay, so Alice can send photon and uh, she wants she send one to bits of information, either zero or one, and which you know, the purpose is to generate secret key. Okay, so here you don't want it, you don't send your information directly. You first generate secret key, then do the this protocol of one time pad to send the encrypted message. So here, what Alice does is she can randomly generate these bits, zero or one, and she randomly generates another bit which tell, uh, tells her how to encode the information. If she, the second bit, if it's zero, it's encoding horizontal vertical polarization. If the second bit is one, it's encoding um, plus or minus 45 degree polarization, okay? Then what she does is that she can uh, follow this instruction and sending these randomly generated photon with different polarization, encoding the information to Bob. And what Bob can do is that he can randomly switch the measurement of these photons, either with horizontal or vertical polarization, or with plus minus 45 degree polarization. Okay, so, um, which he, he has no idea what the basis that Alice chosen. So there will be 50% of the time, he actually happened to be chosen in the right basis while the other 50% in the wrong basis, okay? But it's okay because Bob can later tell Alice what basis he chosen. And then they will come up with a common set subset of measurement outcomes that Alice and Bob choose the same basis, okay? So here is kind of like, a, uh, for example, uh, an example, I suppose Alice sends a sequence of these different polarizations of photons that encodes her information in the random bits of zeros and one, okay? And then what Bob does is that he choose some like a random basis to measure. And about half of the time, Alice and Bob choose consistent basis because for example, the first case, both of them choose a diagonal basis to encode and to measure. And in this uh, fourth column, both of them choose horizontal vertical basis. And if they choose the same basis, then there's a guarantee that the state that Alice encoded should be exactly the state that Bob measured with the same polarization. Therefore, they should have the correct consistent agreement of between like what's the bits that Alice encode and what's the bits that Bob inferred from his measurement. So, and then ideally they should already generate their secret key. But on the safe side, they may want to check to confirm, spend a small portion of a secret key to confirm that indeed the outcomes agree. And if so, then they will be able to kind of uh, uh, be confident that the remaining parts of the secret key are indeed secure and only shared between them. Okay, so uh, this is kind of like this protocol which was invented by uh, Charlie Bennett and uh, Brassard in 1980, which is why they call the BB84 protocol. Okay, so it has been a while. And this is one of the first protocols that the people kind of took the quantum information perspective to say that, wow, there's something interesting and unique about quantum for communication, for example. And the comments here is that it's important to send single photons because if you send two photons or more, 
then you can imagine there's a dropper that can steal a photon and keep a copy. And later when Bob tell Alice what the base is, and you can also imagine the same basis, then she will know what the encoded message or this random secret is, okay, the random key is, okay. And also it's uses the property that in quantum mechanics, you actually cannot simultaneously measure in two complementary bases. Like you cannot simultaneously measure position and momentum in quantum mechanics. And here it's corresponding, you cannot measure in both horizontal, vertical or plus or minus 45 degree basis. And it is this property that excludes the possibility that eavesdropper can do, okay? And uh, more fundamentally, it's exactly because of no cloning that for Eve, this is an unknown state and she cannot make a copy without changing the state, okay? So therefore that uh, basically that uh, this excludes the possibility of eavesdropping and ensures the security. And practically there is a challenge that the photon, if the, if the photon loss, then it reduces the secret key, okay? And the more time being lost, the slower the communication becomes. So there is a natural question like, okay, how far apart can we generate such a secret key for our purpose of quantum communication, right? Because I guess that really nowadays that there is a high expectations about communication, it better be like a global communication to can communicate to everyone in the world. And can we do that without quantum communication? And uh, this, that's something which is actually pretty challenging because indeed it's actually pretty challenging to send a single photon to the other side of the earth, okay? Because our current fibers are pretty lossy. And so like that's something which people are currently actively investigating, which probably will take a talk a little bit more in the later part. So. And maybe, that, but this leads to a natural, very useful application called a quantum network. Okay, what is a quantum network? It's a network that allows you to send quantum states over, or you can generate quantum entanglement over, so that you can use it as a resource for secure communication, or use it for like a secure quantum cloud computing or clock synchronization, quantum sensors, or some quantum games, if you, there is something that we can also play with. Okay, so. Uh, so for the quantum network, uh, as I mentioned earlier, people have worked on it probably even more than 10, 10 years ago. And what people find, if you look at these network, here is a network in Tokyo network, and this is a Swiss network, Geneva network. And you find that they typically have a scale of the tens of kilometers. There is a reason because these networks are either free space or with fiber. And it turns out that the photon, of, like a free space or fiber there, they both tend to absorb photon. And the typical, like uh, the lens scale that the single photon can survive is called attenuation lens, which is about like 20 kilometers. So the longer you go, then the exponentially, uh, uh, like uh, the exponentially small chance that you will actually transmit a single photon through. So suppose you have this 10 to 12 at a terahertz rate of sending single photons, then after about like a, and uh, it's like a thousand kilometers, probably like you will only get a photon once per year, okay? So basically like it's completely useless because if you get a photon, very likely you get it from something else, not from the sender. So therefore it's a challenge because of this attenuation, okay? So then you may say, okay, well, how do we do in classical world? We actually do it differently because in classical world, we have classical repeaters. And in classical repeaters, we can amplify the signal and send it over to the next station. So there is a way to do classical relay. While quantum mechanics were in this dilemma that we're taking advantage of no cloning to ensure security of quantum state, while at the same time, we cannot duplicate unknown quantum states. So we need to come up with some other idea to send this quantum or to generate a quantum entanglement or send the unknown quantum state over longer distance. So generally there are two approaches to do it. And the one approach is called this satellite-based quantum links. Okay, and this is kind of like a pioneering experiment, which I think uh, by Jianwei Pan's group in China, which they kind of like launched the satellite around the end of uh, like uh, 2016. And uh, after one year, they collect enough data, they claim that actually they can send secret keys via the satellite. So the nice thing about satellite is the following. We, uh, we know that on earth, we have atmosphere, which is absorbing. But when you go to outer space, it's essentially vacuum. So photons will not be absorbed when you send in the outer space. So therefore it can 
communicate over longer distances. And the satellite sort of plays a role. On one hand, it could generate photons that send over ground-based telescope stations, or maybe it can relay between different satellites so you can go to longer, even longer distances. Okay, so, so this is a pretty cool idea, but they're also engineering, uh, engineeringly very challenging. You need to align with the satellite and also for low Earth orbital satellite it moves pretty fast and you only have a few minutes communication time, then the satellite is go to the other side of the Earth. Okay, so, uh, and also there's a challenge part, which is maybe limited bandwidth. And also if it's a cloudy day, you unfortunately will not be able to see the satellite with the frequency that you care. Okay, so uh, the se second solution is something with a ground-based quantum links. So this is kind of something similar. We are uh, using existing fiber links, but we want to build something for the quantum repeater. As I mentioned earlier, that we cannot duplicate quantum states. However, there is a way to get around it, which is the idea of using something called quantum teleportation. You can send the, you can prepare entanglement and teleport unknown states to the other side. Okay, so maybe let's look a little bit about the quantum satellite. And uh, one uh, like a very impressive advance on the satellite is basically like they can put like a entanglement source to the quantum satellite. Then they can generate entanglement. And this satellite is pretty big. It's like a 60, 600 kilograms. It's like a um, pretty big satellite. They launch it and then put, it has a height which you can communicate to the ground with a reasonable communication rate. And this is actually there are multiple efforts like internationally. Okay, people are, look, are launching satellites. Like Japan, they also launched this uh, satellite like early on, which kind of like a, they are also planning like new satellites for this uh, quantum key distribution. Singapore and the UK, they also launched something called like a, the Cube satellite, which is a satellite of the size of a shoebox. And you try to miniaturize all the, all the optical source and the detectors on the satellite so that you can launch them. And with a limited cost, maybe like, a, I don't know, a hundred million, or maybe some million of dollars, you can already launch a satellite rather than compared to like maybe billions of dollars to launch a satellite. It's much cheaper and much more affordable. And also like uh, Canada also plan launching satellites. So there are lots of these international efforts that people are doing it. And I, I would be surprised that the NASA is also planning something like this as well. So um, the different approach, which is actually using the repeater based stations, that uh, there are also like a significant advances in different countries. For example, in China, there's this like a 2000 kilometer dark fiber link from Beijing to Shanghai which has multiple trusted repeater nodes. And I think that uh, earlier this year, there was also experimental demonstration. It's sort of, they even connect these uh, fiber links from like Beijing all the way to like Hefei to Shanghai, and also connect that to the satellite as well. So they can cover more areas with this combined effort. But so far, I would point out there's a limitation with uh, the existing demonstration is that you may notice that these nodes they call the trusted nodes. So what does it mean by trusted nodes? Is that basically you need to put like uh, people to guard those nodes to ensure the security of the network. Okay, because if somebody breaks into a node, they might be able to break down, crack down the entire communication system to do eavesdropping. Okay, so this is some limitation of the existing scheme. And the ultimate goal of building a quantum network is that actually we do not really need to trust these nodes, even with untrusted nodes, we can still achieve secure quantum communication. And that's something which actually people are currently like working on to, to implement a more demanding quantum network protocol, which will enable us to do trusted, untrusted node repeaters. Okay, so uh, I think this is something which probably will happen in the next few years, which I guess that's uh, also in the, uh, in the in, uh, like many multiple countries are working on it. Uh, for example, here, like in Netherlands, there is a Delft quantum network, which they actually separated by a few kilometers. And then they can verify that there is a violation of a break of this like a local realism of quantum uh, um, to verify fundamental aspects of quantum. And they are also plan to expand over multiple locations uh, in Netherlands and they try to build a quantum network simulators and so on. So, and also in UK, there's also this network which connecting uh, in, in this university, uh, in Cambridge University, they also build some like uh, these different links that try to uh, demonstrate quantum network protocols. 
And also in the United States, like in Chicago, we also have this Chicago quantum loop to demonstrate the quantum network. And uh, I also think that at Yale, there's also some discussions that uh, try to um, connect to uh, this uh, Brookhaven National Lab uh, at the Stony Brook University. And uh, I guess that probably if you, on some of the nice weather, if you look across kind of the, uh, the ocean, you can actually see there's some like a, kind of like a buildings on the other side, which is uh, actually, uh, it's uh, Stony Brook University and the Brookhaven National Lab and so on. So it, it might be able to send a single photons over there to build a quantum communication between institutions. Okay, so uh, here is actually like a comparison with different networks, but don't worry about detail. The conclusion is actually, so far there's no demonstration of a quantum repeater. <laughs> so, so, okay, that's something which is a good opportunity for people to explore and uh, demonstrate a quantum repeater, then we will be able to making, being uh, able to build a large scale quantum network. Okay, so now what's so challenging about uh, doing, building a quantum repeater and how do we actually like uh, overcome them? So I would say uh, it's actually, uh, so the, the opportunity for quantum is there is no cloning theorem. You cannot duplicate unknown quantum state. It also poses a challenge because we cannot duplicate and make a copy of state like what we do with the classical communication. Okay. Uh, and there's also practical challenges that the photons will be lost by your fibers. And also when you do quantum gates, there will be errors. Okay. So how do we overcome these challenges? So let's say there are two targeted challenges. One is loss error, the other is operation error. Okay. And they're actually, it turns out surprisingly simple that we only have two ways to overcome these challenges. One way is called error detection. The other way is called error correction. Okay. Error detection by definition is you just detect the error. And once you detect it, you just re restart. If there's no error, you move on. And the error correction is something a bit more sophisticated than error detection because you might be able to correct the error if you detect them. So the error detection is a probabilistic stochastic procedure, while error correction is a deterministic procedure. And the reason I want to emphasize that is because in the communication, it does make a difference. If you do error detection, then you need to, if you detect error, you should tell the other party that you detect error. While for error correction, you don't need to tell anybody else because it was sort of guaranteed to succeed, you can continue moving on. So it's error detection, you need to communicate back and forth with two-way signaling. While correction, you don't need that. Okay, and the, the reason we care about the whether or need, you need the two-way signaling is because the speed of light is finite. And when we go talk about the quantum internet over continental scale, then we do care, okay, such a delay. Just to think about it, like, uh, it take up, okay, with one second, the light can wrap around the earth for about like 7.5 times, right? So if, so that's, that's a non negligible delay if you want to achieve fast communication. So, so that's kind of like, but error detection is relatively easy. So we envision maybe the first generation of quantum repeater or quantum network will based on error detection. While later on, you can probably correct the operation error or maybe correct both loss and operation error. That will be like a second generation quantum repeater or third generation quantum repeater. Kind of like a similar to our classical network, we have like a 1G, 2G, 3G, now we have 5G network, right? So this is kind of like in terms of level of difficulty, we envision probably the quantum network will have a similar performance. And then once, if we could get to like the ultimate, like a 3G, this quantum network, then probably our communication speed will not be limited by distance, but only limited by how fast you can do those quantum operations. Similar to our classical network, nowadays what's limiting for these communication speed is this uh, electro-optical modulator. And here it's similar. If you can do quantum gates fast, you will be able to achieve like a ultra fast quantum network. So, um, but this is a global effort. Many countries are working on it and there are multiple approaches, satellite-based or ground-based fiber links. Okay, so maybe just like a um, kind of like a overview of a quantum network and other applications. So here the key challenge of quantum network is to build a larger scale quantum network because a smaller scale, like a city-sized scale, there are already companies that already have like a commercial, like a, like a development to build these local scale quantum network. But uh, how to build a larger scale quantum network? I think that's still open 
research and engineering question. Okay. And uh, so I guess that's uh, probably besides networks, there are also other applications such as quantum computing, which I think you probably heard many news about like the Google demonstrate like quantum advantage. And uh, also like, I think in China, there was also another experiment like uh, claiming having quantum advantage. And also IonQ also have like a large device being launched. And here probably I didn't include this. Amazon also claim they want to do some efforts with the quantum bracket. And uh, IBM also have Qiskit that's well known. And I know like uh, if you took uh, Professor Steve Gervin's class, he actually teaches uh, students how to use the Qiskit for some of the quantum projects. So indeed there are lots of quantum platforms. And uh, however, I think it's still wide open because uh, 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 honestly, nobody knows what the future quantum computer will look like. Okay, There's these platforms, some use atoms, some use solid state materials, and there are some platform using optical photon. So it's a very different platform and it is a, still a wide open research to find the best platform for quantum computer. So one thing which probably we could learn from kind of what people do with the kind of, a, kind of not like electronics, uh, earlier people used vacuum tubes to build computer. But actually later on, what takes over is the semiconductor technology that takes over. Now you have all the transistors, which is very efficient for integration and you can build a large scale device. And I guess that here is similar like a quantum that uh, it's probably like a, maybe it's by no means that the current leading platform will guarantee to be the platform for a large scale quantum computer. Okay, so it's still wide open research for people to look into, yeah. And uh, in addition to this computing communication, the quantum, we can also look into quantum metrology and sensing. So I assume like for physics audience that probably might heard that the gravitational wave detection like a few years ago, right? Which gets a Nobel prize, which the gravitational wave detector called the, the LIGO device, which actually the latest version, they actually incorporates the, something called the squeeze light, which you can see into using some quantum and uh, like a uh, non-trivial quantum states to enhance the sensitivity. So, and uh, this is a larger scale for LIGO. And here is a picture, it span a few kilometers. This is actually a quantum device at a, such a large scale. And they can also consider extreme small scale. You can also use like this nano, nano diamond sensor, which is essentially like, what is the smallest magnetic sensor you can build? Okay, so you might think, okay, well, you can build like a smaller squid. You can even make it smaller, smaller up to the level of a single electron. Because electron, single electron has an electronic spin, which will be sensitive to the magnetic field. So if you could trap a single electron in a solid crystal, then that will be, or even a nano crystal, that will be a kind of like a nat naturally provided minimum sensor that can sense magnetic field. Why we want to build the small sensors? Because we know magnetic field are very weak if it produced from like an individual atom, then if you can put it very close to your target, then you will be very sensitive to atom. And also like you can potentially do something using nano sensors, sensors to do something like a single molecule NMR. Because nowadays we do nuclear magnetic resonance, we always have big machines and the measure ensemble. But if you could build these nano sensors, one of the hope is that maybe we can perform NMR over individual molecules then you will be able to see, understand what's going on inside the molecule. And so that will be really exciting to do it. And uh, maybe besides uh, communication, computing or sensing, there's also efforts about the quantum simulation, right? So I think that at Yale, there are also like a code atom experiment platforms that people are building quantum simulator to understand, for example, the origin of high TC superconductivity. So this is kind of like echo back to original Feynman's proposal that, uh, okay, maybe you should build a quantum system to really understand our quantum world. Okay, so um, I guess the reason that we want to isolate the simulator from a quantum computer is that in principle, if you have a universal quantum computer, you should be able to say as well. But the simulator probably could be easier to build than a quantum computer because it probably requires, it's less demanding uh, in terms of the fault tolerance and so on. So, and uh, I guess that's probably like uh, maybe um, most of the things. And uh, in case people are interested in like quantum computation applications, there are short factoring algorithms, global search algorithm, 
And there are also some recent development of a quantum machine learning algorithm, which is, uh, and also like a quantum variation of eigensolvers, which probably can also solve some of the chemistry problems. But I guess that uh, those actually uh, are still like a, a open research questions because uh, there is no guarantee that these algorithms will outperform classical ones. Unlike like a factory or uh, the Grover search, it's pretty solid that definitely you'll have a better situation than the classical one. Uh, while the other quantum algorithms, it's like, a, uh, it's, we know it's pretty hard for classical computers to do, but to actually we sometimes don't know how good our quantum computer is really doing or it's, there's no guarantee that actually quantum will have exponential advantage compared to classical algorithm. Okay, so maybe just as a, like a final like a remark, I would say like a quantum information is an emerging exciting field. It's highly interdisciplinary, which you have mass, physics, chemistry, material science, engineering, and computer science all coming together. And it has a wide range of applications, which including simulation, communication, metrology, and computing. So I think it's it's a exciting time to actually like to study quantum, and uh, sometimes people call this the second revolution of quantum. It's because kind of the first revolution of quantum is kind of understand the collective behavior of a quantum system, like solid state physics, semiconductors, lasers, NMR. It's a collective behavior, and now we actually can push to a new level that we can control and. Uh, and feedback and initialize, manipulate individual quantum systems. So that leads to the new applications such as computing, communication, and metrology, which the previously the collective operation would not be able to achieve. So that's why sometimes people call this the second quantum revolution. Now we will be able to demonstrate or achieve like more applications and which is exceeding what we have already done with the kind of like semiconductors or lasers and so on but we will be able to build like a quantum device for computing, communication and sensing. Yeah, so I think that's probably like, a, um, or uh, that's all I have. And uh, I guess if you have questions, we can definitely, uh, I'm open to like chat more, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, so uh, thanks so much, uh, Professor Zhang for coming. I think Jean, she just uh, told me via chat that she has to um, drop off the call at eight. Mm -hmm. So I'll be handling Q and A. And yeah, thank you so much for joining us. I mean, okay. Um, I have a few questions of my own, but I wanna open up, up to the audience to ask any uh, questions. So if you have any questions, please um, raise your hand or just unmute yourself. And yeah, we'll go from there. Um, could I ask one yeah. from one of your first slides at the start? And you were, you were talking about okay. how yeah. certain how quantum systems are very hard, you know, like uh, high temperature superconductors or the uh, the nitrogen fixation. They're very difficult yeah. to solve on classical computers. And I was I was wondering if you could explain a little bit about what makes quantum systems. You know, our classical computers are so great; they do so many things for us. Why are quantum systems so difficult to simulate classically? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, excellent question. Yeah. Uh, so let me give you one example. Suppose I have like a hundred uh, qubit, okay, a hundred spin, and a uh, hundred, not a big number, okay. And uh, but actually, if you want to simulate the dynamics of a hundred spins, for example, some some like a maybe a bunch of molecules, kind of like in there, and the, actually the degree of freedom you want to encode, characterize is huge. Why? Because each spin, suppose it can point up or down, but it evolved in a quantum world as a superposition. So you need to track all of the two to the hundred possible superposition in your dynamics. And that's an astronomical number, okay? There is no way like you can store it in your, any of your computer or with all the, the, uh, the supercomputers we have in the world, okay? Uh, so. So basically the, the size that you need to store or process will grow exponentially with the quantum system size. Okay, so it's, it's not a double the spin will double the complexity. No, it's a double the spin. You actually go from like a two to the 50 to two to the 100. Okay, that's a astronomical growth. And therefore that's why actually uh, like uh, the current supercomputer, they can probably do up to 50 qubits, but above that, 
the people just okay don't waste your electricity of doing that okay uh, because it's just a, a really like a demanding to do it and maybe they can push a little bit further instead of start limited by your hard drive <laughs> and then all the other <laughs> things that become limited okay so so that's why like it's really hard to simulate and uh, another reason is that actually underlying this uh, and this phenomena it's really the quantum phenomena so we cannot do just a simple classical approximation and say, okay, this molecule move this way, that molecule move that way. That method doesn't work. Okay, it's not Newtonian mechanics. It's really quantum mechanics. So if you want to use a quantum mechanics to describe this thing, to simulate it, then you will encounter this huge overhead in just distorting this particular state. And for this natural fixation, it's similar. Okay, even though we say, okay, it's a biological thing, it's at a room temperature, but those processes actually happen at a pretty fast time scale. So it does maintain its quantum nature. And those chemical reactions, it matters, okay, how the orbitals evolve. Then to describe those chemical orbitals and hybridization, you do need a quantum language to describe it. So that's why actually quantum play a crucial role and to faithfully understand it, then you really need to have, okay, uh, okay either a huge exponential growth of a classical device or maybe a more efficient like a quantum device. Okay, so that's kind of the key reason that uh, uh, actually, uh, because the underlying word is quantum, it's better to do it quantum than using another less efficient classical simulator or computer to simulate it. Yeah, yeah I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Uh, we, we had a, a question in, in the chat um, and the question was, um, what's mm -hmm. what's the outlook on hybrid networks? Uh, and this is verbatim. So would it improve loss and the need for trusted nodes in a hybrid network? And what are the trade-offs? Um, and I'm not yeah. exactly sure. Uh, yeah, well, I, I think that's also, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to understand like uh, the hybrid network, there could be uh, either like a network, a hybrid quantum cloud network, or maybe a hybrid network with different quantum platform. But I, I think that uh, both of them are interesting to explore. Okay, so first like a classical network combined with quantum, it's in some sense, we kind of implicitly assume that for this like with a two-way classical signaling. Okay, whether or not you successfully generate a quantum state or entanglement, you use a classical network to herald, to inform the other party whether it's successful. So in a sense, we kind of assumed most of the time there is a classical network. But actually sometimes there's a huge demand of the bandwidth, the use of the classical network in order to do some quantum protocols. So, uh, yes, I think it's, it will be helpful to have both quantum classical operating at the same time. And, uh, uh, but I think the quantum cannot be replaced by the classical because uh, indeed it, it does some, offer some uniqueness that can send a quantum state, which unfortunately cannot be sent via a classical network. And the, the other, which is uh, the other aspect of hybrid could be like a, a quantum network of photons, but at the end, it may connect into a quantum device, which is superconducting qubits or like uh, your atomic clocks. And those will actually be very interesting because open us up uh, applications beyond the photon, beyond the communication. Because if you can connect with a quantum network, uh, you connect a different quantum computer, for example, you can connect IBM quantum computer, maybe with a Google quantum computer, or if they don't like, they can connect with other IBM computers, then they can build a more powerful quantum computer if they can connect it by quantum network. Because indeed the qubit number will be added up, then the computational power will grow exponentially. Uh, right now, uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm, I guess that some of you might try the IBM machine, it's we're controlling it via a classical network. And when different class, uh, different IBM machines, when they talk to each other, it's also via a classical network. Then that limits the power. So the growth of a computational power only grows linearly with the number of devices. While if we could build a quantum network to connect them, then the computational power will grow exponentially. So that's a big difference. And similar for clock networks, if you can have a quantum clock network, the sensitivity will also have another boost. Yeah, so that's something which uh, I think that uh, it's, it's really exciting if, uh, uh, because it's kind of on the horizon. We're getting there once we have the network connected. Then what you need is a transducer, which actually uh, Professor Hong Tang's group, which I'm also collaborating with, uh, developing like a quantum transducer 
so that we want to build a version from a microwave photon to optical photon or the other way around. Then you can really hook up your uh, superconducting qubit quantum computer to a quantum network. Yeah. I have kind of a related question uh, about quantum networking specifically yeah. connecting to the uh, satellites. Mm -hmm. So do you know of any initiatives that yeah. kind of focus on people on the ground actually connecting and preparing that quantum state. For example, you construct a circuit uh, on earth, right? It transpiles it, sends it up to the quantum computer, and then it runs the circuit and sends the data where, like, wherever it needs to be. Like what resources or what companies are, is anyone doing that right now? Yeah, I think that that part I'm not directly involved, but I know like a, like a place like NASA, they're thinking about building like a, launching satellite building quantum network. And also like, uh, I think that uh, some of the DOE programs are also exploring these possibilities of connecting. And another thing that before launching a satellite, you can launch something cheaper, like a drone, right? <laughs> now you can buy a drone, like a 300 bucks on Amazon, right, a prison one. And if you can put like a fiber link up there, then you can actually, uh, once it's lifted, you actually can see a broader horizon, right? You can communicate longer. And this is something which people are looking at, like uh, uh, at, uh, and I think like recently the paper, like people say like uh, use the drone to achieve longer distance communication. And uh, also like if you are on the ocean and some like uh, a boat, you can launch the drone, you can probably communicate further, which is uh, really interesting. And then moreover, if you're in a city, probably you may not be able to directly see the other party, but maybe you can launch a drone that is a row of mirror, you can reflect the signal to other places. So, so I think that's, uh, it, I think that's uh, how to say, a very interesting, lots of things that you can play with and uh, to extend your range of communication. Yeah, so even before the satellites, there are already lots of things one can play with. Yeah, so uh, in terms of initiative, I think that uh, right now, like you probably heard this National Quantum Initiative, that uh, there are five like uh, DOE centers, which uh, supported, like uh, Yale is also part of this uh, Brookhaven, uh, like national lab, like a DOE center, which uh, focusing on computing. And uh, here in Chicago, we are also like a close connected to our lab and the Fermi lab, also focusing on quantum networking and the computation. So, so there, and also uh, other places like Berkeley, uh, Florence, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, there are, uh, there are national labs, DOE labs, and also like a DOD and also NSF also have centers connected to that. So, so it's, it's, a, it's a coordinating effort like uh, over the entire nation here in the US, try to develop uh, advanced quantum technology. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And also really globally, close. but also <laughs> even some discussions, if we can connect it to like uh, other countries, like uh, maybe connecting to like uh, Europe to have a transatlantic quantum link. <laughs> but that's uh, probably like uh, in the second phase, but uh, uh, people are very optimistic that uh, maybe we can get to that thing, yeah. So, Professor, I'm, I'm really curious about this uh, idea of like, is quantum error correction on these quantum networks? Like, what would you, would you send uh, like a logical qubit encoded in some sort of surface code over these networks? What does quantum error correction look like for quantum networks? Uh -huh. Yeah, so if it were 10 years ago, I think your idea could write a PIL. Okay, <laughs> because indeed like the people are proposing like using the surface code ideas to like uh, build a quantum network to speed up. Uh, and uh, yes, and, and there are also other codes which probably will be more adapted for this uh, quantum communication channels. For example, like uh, here, we know that to send a wave packets, which are like a bosonic channel. And for communication channel, it's mostly like attenuation or photon loss which is very similar to in the microwave domain in Rob Shukov's experiment, like it's also like a microwave cavity with a lossy channel. So some of the codes that developed at Yale, CAD code, uh, GKP or binomial codes, they could be applied to quantum communication as well. And recently we just uh, submitted a paper of try to put the GKP code, uh, one, one of the bosonic codes, okay, to the quantum network to see if it's, um, or at least we think that certain parameter region, it can speed up the communication. So yeah, indeed, that's, uh, that's something which uh, uh, people are exploring. 
And uh, but to be honest, I think it probably may not be immediately demonstrated because uh, so far there are only very few groups. Uh, like EO is definitely leading the efforts in doing error correction. Uh, but if you want to do error correction over photons, which is actually much harder than error correction over microwave photons. The reason is actually the following. Like uh, for microwave photon, uh, that frequency range, there is a, a good uh, device called the, the Josephson effect, which is a nonlinear effect allow you to do all these nice things about superintendent qubits or error correction. While in the optical domain, we actually, the Josephson effect doesn't work because when you illuminate a superconducting device with optical photon, it's no longer superconducting because they're too high. You excite a lot of quality particles. Okay, so what would be the corresponding nonlinear effect that you can use for uh, the optical quantum information processing? That's still an active research. Okay, so if we could transfer all these control power from microwave to the optical domain, then I think that it will be a significant advance if we want to process or do error correction for quantum network in the optical domain. Yeah. Uh, that's very interesting. I think uh, in the interest of time, because we went a bit over, maybe we can have one final question. Um, if that, yeah, anyone has a question? Otherwise, uh, I had, a, I had a quick follow up. So you said that uh, I have a quick question. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Alan, please yeah. go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please. Yeah. Um, so uh, we know that it has historically been a challenge to uh, quickly load states. Um, for instance, uh, use algorithms to quickly learn a classical discrete probability distribution and represent it as a quantum state. Um, and it has been the bottleneck for a lot of algorithms that promise exponential speed up. Um, so I wonder in the mm -hmm. uh, quantum networking context, um, what are the requirements or um, the desirable criterion um, that would determine the development in, uh, let's say quickly learning or loading probability distributions? Yeah, so I think that's a, uh, well, I think for quantum network, so far, most of the applications is actually to generate entanglement. It's like a kind of a fixed state that you want to generate. Um, but I think what you're talking about is actually there will be a relation. There will be applications where it is that uh, if you want to have a big data center, okay, is there some way to efficiently like access that data center to get the information and uh, probably not overloading the entire network. And uh, I think a quantum could play a very unique role in there. There's something called a quantum random access memory, which is that uh, you can query a data center, say like a wizard, uh, like a billions of bits, uh, okay? And uh, the classical bits, and you want to query it. But actually the quantum, uh, how to say, to address these uh, like a billion bits, you probably only need like a very short sequence of binaries to specify the location we have to do it one by one, which is really unfortunate, okay, to take a long time to scan over the database. However, quantum mechanics, you might be able to do a superposition of address and simultaneously read out all these information, assuming we have a QRAM, okay? And then once you did that, then all the communication that you need over the network is actually just uh, scales logarithmically with the size of a database, okay? Of course, by no means I'm reading out the entire database, but I have some way to read out collectively over the database, which depends on application like a global search or quantum machine learning, those queries are actually sufficient. Okay, so there are like, a, uh, I think in this case, that it's probably hard to imagine a classical analogy that you can kind of read collectively with the entire database, but quantum mechanically, there is a possibility of doing that. And this will actually like, I think, open up a, a new applications and um, right now, like I, as I mentioned earlier, like there was this uh, quantum machine learning. Uh, it's a promising algorithm, but on the other hand, it's controversial because there are some, people have high expectations that, but there are some of the quantum machine learning being dequantized because some really smart, uh, actually students come up, uh, even when he was in undergrad, come up with the algorithm and say, oh yeah, <laughs> some classical algorithm can also do really fast, but it's kind of quantum inspired algorithm. So, so I would say like, a from, from our intellectual perspective, 
it doesn't matter if it's really quantum or classical because it's really inspired efficient algorithm to solve these challenge problems. Uh, but on the, other, on the other hand, I really hope that there'll be some good quantum algorithm, which will like uh, open up more applications uh, to further like enhance the kind of the quantum advantage that we're looking for. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, and, You're welcome. And yeah. On that note, um, a big round of applause for Professor Jung for joining us. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Very nice chatting with you. I just want to jump in here and say uh, people from RSL and QLab says hi. And they all left because it's late. And But yeah, <laughs> everyone miss you. I see. OK, uh, yeah, it's glad to, to see people from RSL and the QLab. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Professor. Um, and if it's okay, we, we would love to send out a mm -hmm. recording to this uh, of this talk, um, you know, to the rest of our club. Uh, and yes, everyone, everyone here, stay tuned. We're gonna have okay. some yeah, um, sure. really, mm -hmm. really awesome uh, in the same way undergrad accessible talks in in the future. Um, and yeah, thank you so much again, Professor Jiang, for joining us. Uh, this is a real pleasure. <laughs> Okay, yeah, it's, it's very nice meeting with all of you. Yeah, hope we'll have a chance to meet in person because I probably will come to back to Yale very often. <laughs> yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. Bye-bye, everyone. Yeah. Thank you.